Good afternoon, I'm Paolo Maggiolini, Associate Research Fellow at ISPI and Research and Lecturer at the Catholic University of Milan. Today I welcome you to our virtual panel, Jordan Beyond the Royal Rumble. And as the title uh, well described, today we will look uh, at Jordan beyond the most recent issue of the alleged coup. But we will focus on the challenges that the country is experiencing and uh, we will discuss which are the key factors that can enable uh, uh, the kingdom to achieve those reforms that are under discussion uh, since uh, 2013 and more recently 2018. Uh, let me first remember that this meeting is part of a series of virtual events uh, co-organized co with a prestigious international specialized organization ahead of the seventh edition of the Romad Dialogue, which will be held from the 2nd to the 4th December 2021, hopefully in an in-person uh, format. So today, why this virtual panel of Jordan? Uh, as we know, in the last two de decades, Jordan has experienced uh, multiple challenges uh, to its stability. The kingdom has confirmed uh, its ability to deal uh, with developments and threats, and given its position in the geopolitical map, uh, this is uh, of utmost uh, importance. Some of these challenges uh, stemmed from the region. Uh, this went from the ongoing geopolitical competition to wars and conflict uh, at its borders. In this regard, uh, we can just uh, think about uh, tension raised by the Trump plan, uh, all issues related to possible impact of the Abraham Accord on Jordan traditional role in the region. But other challenges uh, developed uh, within its domestic uh, political uh, uh, field, and they are connected to the necessary political and socioeconomic uh, reforms uh, that have been recurrently promised, but not yet fully implemented and achieved. Uh, since 2018, I insist on, uh, this, on this date because are at least two years that we are witnessing uh, the, this uh, dynamic. Uh, we witness uh, uh, rising protest and dissent. Uh, last year, uh, these have culminated in some significant political events. In this regard, we can mention the issue involving teacher association or the association of Muslim Brotherhood. And today we know the alleged coup uh, with many speculation around it. In any case, uh, without mentioning the burden and, re of, uh, and responsibility of taking care of the numerous refugee community hosting in the country, today what is surely concerning uh, is the econo uh, economic condition of Jordan. And in this field, the impact of the pandemic. And here I'm referring, for instance, to the growing level of the national debt, contraction of the Jordan GDP, and the higher rate of unemployment, particularly affecting youth. In any case, these are only few of many issues at stake, but today we have four most distinguished speakers that will help us to assess and evaluate Jordan's present situation. So let me introduce them and thank them for being with us. We have, we have uh, Zaid Eyadat, Director of, for the Center of, of Strategic Studies uh, at the University of Jordan and Lead of Learn Jordan Working Group. Welcome, Zaid. Katarzyna Sidro, Director of the Middle East and North Africa Department, Center for uh, Social and Economic Research, Holland. Welcome, Katarzyna. Tuka Nuzairat, direct, the Deputy Director of the Rafikariri Center and Middle East Program at the Atlantic Council, where she oversees initiative on promoting security, human development in the Middle East and North Africa. Welcome, Tuka. And finally, Besma Bomani, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. She's also a senior fellow at the Center of Internet for International Governance and Innovation and no resident fellow at the Arab Gulf State Institute, Washington, D.C. Welcome, Besma. So before giving the mic to our speaker, I would like just to remember uh, to all participants um, that they can submit questions to our panelists uh, through the chat on this platform. Uh, or they can write uh, their question through other applications where the webinar is streamed. 
So in this way, we start to collect uh, questions since the beginning, but we will answer them in the second part of the webinar. So, uh, Zaid, let me start uh, from you. Uh, just to begin, I think it is important to give an, an overview of Jordan's present situation. Uh, so how do you assess Jordan, uh, Jordanian attitude uh, and perception amidst uh, the current economic challenges uh, and the pandemic? Well, uh, thank you, Paolo, and a good evening to you. Uh, I'm delighted to be among a very special experts uh, to uh, discuss Jordan's situations beyond the world rumbles. Uh, and uh, also, let me uh, extend my gratitude to SP for organizing such an important webinars and seminars, including this one in Jordan. Uh, to address directly your question about social attitudes or if you wish perceptions of Jordanian of their economic and social situations in a way of assessing Jordan's status quo today, uh, I will be unfortunately bringing uh, very negative numbers and not very optimistic future if we look at the perceptions, attitudes and, and also opinions of Jordanians and some experts as well. Uh, and there are a few issues that have been consistent over time, which led to much more uh, challenges uh, the governments uh, over time also been facing. The first of which is the trust gap. So in Jordan, we're talking about a widening, deepening trust gap between citizens and the institutions. And uh, on the top of these institutions that the public do not trust at all, on the top of that is the government and the consequence governments. And we've been recording this over the last 20 years. So there is a problem and a huge problem when Jordanians do not trust their governments. And therefore, whatever the governments do, even if it is honest about what they are doing and trying to do, the perception is not in the mood to receive the government's, uh, let's say, policies, priorities, agenda, and everything is questionable. Uh, so this, this widening trust gap also uh, not, is not limited to the government. The public opinions shows that Jordanians don't trust also the parliament. Uh, and, you know, if the citizens do not trust their representatives, uh, this actually raises a lot of important questions. Uh, why you choose them at the first place? And this will lead us totally to the issue of elections in Jordan, electoral law, and the elections by design, and all the criticism that we know about Jordan's uh, elections. Uh, just for example, latest uh, elections that took place back on uh, October of 2020, October, November, uh, only uh, less than 30% of the populations who are eligible to vote participated in that elections. In our recent polls about what extent Jordanians trust the parliament and their ability to do their job, uh, and it is the highest number we get since 20 years, and it's only 32% of Jordanian trust the parliament can do uh, a good job or deliver to the duties they have to do. And that, you know, uh, you can you can imagine and expand and extend that to other institutions in Jordan. The two important institutions that is still actually uh, receive uh, Jordanians' trust and support uh, is the army and the security agen agencies. Uh, and this big for a big, 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 huge um, uh Raise important, huge question and big for uh, explanation why the case, why that is the case. So that is the first one: is the trust gap. Now, if you bring the issues of perception uh, on corruption and a mal are doing in Jordan, this will add to the trust gap and deepen it. So perception of corruption in Jordan is too high among Jordanians and both the public and the private sectors. And that is also a, a very serious issue that actually reflects itself on the trust issue, uh, as I presented at the very beginning. Uh, now, whether the perceptions are accurate, uh, are correct, the, the cases that Jordanians talk about in their social media and they live about the corruption and corruption scandals, whether they're true or not is not too important because perception is too strong in this case and just, just you know, just 
color uh, the entire picture of how citizens perceive governments and and government institutions uh, practices. Now, more importantly, majority of Jordanian do not see that things are going in the right direction. And this is a constant and you know ongoing question we ask uh, over time with the weekly pulse that we initiated or with the larger public opinions we do at the CSS. Uh, so over time, there is a trend. Uh, majority of Jordanian, when I say majority, more than 65, actually, not more than 50, they do not see things are going in the right direction, which means, again, they lost faith in the ability of the governments and the existing institutions and existing political process to deliver to Jordanians' demands and needs. Worse, they do think when it comes to the economic issues that their situation today, their economic situations today, is worse than it used to be 12 months ago. And it will be worse after 12 months than it is now. So that tells you that they lost faith and optimism at all. Now, the scary numbers, of course, when it comes to poverty and unemployment, and you know, reports have been saying that uh, poverty in Jordan has increased more than 80% over the last few years, which means that adding more than 500,000 people under the poverty line in Jordan, uh, which you know, millions of people living under poverty lines, uh, and uh, the unemployment uh, rate has increased highly. Uh, officially, it is 20 in the fourth quarter, uh, and it is more than 55 among uh, youth, and it is much higher when it comes to females. So in the gender issues, it is so concentrated. Now, this goes without saying, you know, unemployment with poverty, with lack of trust, with perception of corruption, with vision that things will be even worse in the future, that tells you about the situations and uh, explain easily all the social tensions in Jordan and the, the, the discussions about the possible social unrest. Uh, the social cohesion issues is really serious in Jordan. Now, if you also add to that, I have a lot of numbers. I don't want to just, you know, read the numbers for you. Maybe I will pick some of them because, you know, in the exercise of what we've done at uh, the center, uh, the CSC, uh, CSS, uh, regarding Jordan's possible economic scenarios, uh, the best possible scenario will lead that Jordan will have its economic recovery uh, at you know at the best situations three to four to five years uh, if they implement immediately what they have to do in terms of vaccination and you know bringing all economic sectors back to work with the government only yesterday saying that they cannot even do it before uh, before July 1st. Uh, and our prediction was they have to do it actually on March uh, latest. Now, they're not starting reopening the sectors, uh, nor giving the vaccination. You know, less than 1% in, of Jordanians has been, been vaccinated. Uh, and this has been going very, very bad. So if you, if you, if you take also what the COVID uh, impacts has added to the economic situations, to the perceptions of the government uh, and the government practices, the way the government has uh, has managed both the uh, health crisis and socioeconomic crisis associated with that, that also tells you about the situation in Jordan. So all what I'm trying to do is just you know, bring all these numbers to show to what extent all of these situations are reaching a dangerous level that could seriously, could seriously threaten social stability in Jordan and internal stability in Jordan. Now, if you combine that with one important thing, two important things, and I'll, I'll stop here. I know I have yeah. four things to say. Yeah, we will. The death of politics, and I would like this to be underlined, death of politics in Jordan. There is no political process in Jordan. There is no political dynamics in Jordan. You know, people are left behind and away. They pushed away from being part of the decision-making process or even the public discussions about decisions and the directions the country should take. Uh, people just, you know, are just surprised about the decisions made by the government and they have no clue why the decisions are made on what basis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the death of politics, meaning that the process is dead at all. And that's why the consensus today in Jordan is about the need for political reform. And the last thing is about the identity crisis and the divide within Jordan. Jordan is not as simple as it looks. It's very complicated when it comes to social fabrics. It is divided. And at some point, I can, you know, I can 
confidently say it is deeply divided in so many different lines. So that, in all, tells you that situation in Jordan are not internally are not that good. Thank you so much, uh, Zaid, for uh, your overview that allow us to, to launch uh, our discussion. To come to Katarzyna, I would like to ask you, uh, what is your understanding of the current economic condition in Jordan? Uh, and uh, what have Jordan uh, perspective for the future? So we can uh, keep what Zaid said uh, and bring further through your uh, perspective. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, now, I'm afraid my message is not going to be very optimistic either. Um, when you think about the economic situation in Jordan, even before the pandemic, it has not been great. The economic growth has been stalled for a couple of years before the pandemic emerged at roughly 2% uh, growth. Uh, the unemployment has been persistently high um, of course, among women and the youth, um, especially. And um, the country has been very heavily reliant on foreign assistance. And the foreign debt has uh, already amounted to over 90% of Jordanian GDP just before the pandemic. Um, now, COVID-19, of course, is everywhere else, just exacerbated the situation. Um, so the GDP by the latest data um, declined by 1.5% during the first three quarters of 2020, which actually is not that bad when you compare with the average uh, for other countries in the MENA region, which is around 3.8%. Um, but some other numbers don't really look great, uh, unfortunately. So the central government debt... Um, has gone up. Um, I think CSS actually estimated that it was by 10% at the end of 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, then we have the current account deficit that, that widened, um, actually nearly doubled again, according to uh, CSS. And this has been mostly due to the collapse of the tourism sector, which of course suffered throughout the pandemic all over the world. Um, now in case of Jordan, um, it accounted, the, the tourism and travel sector, it accounted for um, roughly 18% of GDP and roughly 19% of total employment in 2019. And this is a lot. This is double the global average, which is around 20% for both. So um, what, what we have seen is um, that the pandemic killed both the foreign tourism and domestic tourism. I apologize, my neighbors decided to start renovation now. Um, so also internally, the internal tourism, uh, domestic tourism has also suffered and the broadly understood hospitality tourism like wedding halls being closed. Um, so in the third quarter of 2020, the income from foreign tourism equal roughly 1 billion euro, which is roughly 2.6 billion fewer than in 2020, the year before. Um, now, of course, that led, uh, among others, to, to increasing unemployment. As, as I mentioned um, before, me, the official rate for the third quarter of 2020 is 24.7%, but the actual unemployment rate is likely um, much higher than that. Of course, uh, unemployment among women and uh, young people is even higher. So when you look at this um, recently released data for the fourth quarter of 2020, the uh, unemployment rate for women was nearly double that than um, for men. And now um, looking at the upcoming months, uh, it doesn't look like um, when it comes to the unemployment situation, we're really Proof. Um, there's been some recent reports in the press uh, about warnings coming from a representative of trade unions and business associations that said that uh, most likely they will have to um, undertake mass reductions in employment. So, for instance, with the uh, clothes, textiles, um, and shoe trader. Um, they announced that uh, they might have to let go around 56,000 workers if things don't change on the top of closing um, a significant number of establishments. Um, of, on the top of that, we have uh, Jordanians coming back from abroad um, because the economic situation in other countries is not uh, great either. Um, so this both contributes to higher unemployment rates and to the remittances going down. Um, and again, I will quote the report by CSS by Professor Yadat, which says, uh, estimates that the remittances from Jordanian expatriates in 2020 were lower by 12% compared to 2019. So um, the situation does really not look great. And um, in the short term, um, 
it will really depend on the pace of vaccination. Um, again, as uh, they said, only around 0.6% of the population has been vaccinated by mid-February. And this, this is really, really low number, uh, which doesn't bode well for the future. Um, so the lockdown will probably continue. Um, the sectors will not be able to, to open up anytime soon. Um, in the long, long term, of course, uh, this, is, this goes way beyond the vaccination. This goes into the uh, capacity of Jordanian government to implement um, reforms to um, stop over, uh, being over-reliant on foreign assistance. Um, the World Bank estimates that uh, in 2021, the economy in Jordan will grow by 1.4%. Um, but of course, in order to do that in the short term, Jordan has to keep on borrowing money and keep on relying on foreign aid, which is not a very sustainable um, long term strategy. Um, but I will finish on that because I believe in the next round, we'll be talking a little bit more about the foreign engagement in um, the Jordanian economy. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Katarzyna, for, for your contribution. And then uh, uh, we move to Tuka. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what are the main political demands in today Jordan? Uh, we saw during the previous uh, two speech, uh, we talk more uh, about uh, demands uh, and, uh, and the different issues at stake. So I would like to have uh, your opinion on, uh, on this, uh, and especially what is the present condition of uh, social mobilization or collective action in the country? Thank you, Paolo, and thank you to ISPI for convening this panel. Um, let me talk a little bit about a few trends when it comes to the social mobilization in Jordan. Um, as my colleague uh, Zaid uh, mentioned, this incredibly low trust in government and the gap in trust in government has led uh, Jordanians to completely disengage from the political system. So um, they don't believe in that their parliamentary representatives are going to carry their grievances up the chain. And that has driven many Jordanians into the streets uh, during peak moments of frustration. So we've seen a number of consistent protests uh, over the past decade. Um, most, you know, um, in 2018 brought down the government when there was a proposed um, new uh, income tax uh, hike. And um, in 2019, uh, the teachers syndicate also coalesced to um, strike for demanding um, an increase in wages. So the fact that people are not believing in government and in the institutions has driven them in some ways to the streets. Now, these protests have been consistent, but it's kind of a pattern where people go into the streets, they let out a lot of frustration. There's a crackdown, which is increasingly uh, more uh, harsh than it was before. Um, and at the same time, activists are arrested or the press is completely constrained. Um, you know, there's a, a number of uh, cyber laws and defense laws that have been enacted to really tighten the grip on uh, these uh, forms of dissent. So if Jordanians don't have, um, don't believe in their institutions and, and can't really protest, so that, that, that combines for a really combustible combination. Um, that... Uh, that cycle of protest versus calming down versus crackdown uh, continues, has continued. And we saw most recently protests um, in light of COVID restrictions and COVID economic um, difficulties has continued. But the, the protesters are asking for the same thing and highlighting the same thing. As Professor Yadad said, um, you know, the perception of corruption is a top concern for most uh, Jordanians. And they're always looking internally at, you know, how, um, significant amounts of foreign aid are mismanaged in their in their view and you know continuously um, protesting lack of jobs high cost of living and um, this fraying of the social safety nets that existed before um, now another trend is the fact that these protests are different than they were let's say in the um, <clears throat> before the Arab Spring a lot of times uh, they were predominantly represented by large parties like the Islamist movement in Jordan. Um, now you have a, a much younger population that is protesting um, through what is called the Hayrak in Jordan. And um, you have a more diverse cross-section of Jordanians, including working class and middle class Jordanians that are incredibly frustrated and willing to go out into the streets and protest. 
Um, so you, it's not limited to a certain group of people that are engaged in, a, in the political process as it was before. It's, it's wider um, ability of people to feel like they can go on social media and, and protest. They can go into the streets and protest. And at the same time, this points to the lack of the ability of the Jordanian government to um, engage in a process of reconciliation, engage in discussions with key figures, whether it's tribal leaders, whether it's um, leaders of syndicates or uh, people in, um, you know, in the business community. This is you know, not allowing uh, Jordanians to engage in a process of um, being able to connect with the government in the past, you know, even the king, uh, the late king Hussein was involved, uh, you know, when, when there was like big outbursts of, of, of protests. Uh, but right now you feel like there is um, more of a crackdown, like I mentioned. Um, uh, Islamist parties have been extremely curtailed um, as, as, as the Muslim Brotherhood was, was tied down in 2015. And even when there are legitimate forms of participation, such as through professional syndicates, which have a long history of engagement in Jordan and political activity, um, you know, like the example of the teacher syndicate is, is, is a prime example because, um, you know, protesting a fact like going on strike, a very uh, democratic form of protest was completely um, muffled and there was just a, no way that the government could reach a resolution between, um, between the teachers and, and the government. So, um, those trends, like I mentioned, have driven Jordanians uh, to protest in the streets, but it's a continuous cycle of protests calming down um, and then going back up again in the crackdown. But the, the, the demands are similar and the demands are, are the same across the board every year after year, even if the, um, the reason for the outburst is, is different every year. So as, as my colleagues have mentioned, um, the uh, COVID pandemic obviously has exacerbated the situation, but you've also seen that a number of indices of measuring freedoms and in Jordan have indicated that the country is going into the authoritarian realm. So while it was, you know, often lauded as, as a country that is able to manage um, being a hybrid of a, a monarchy, but also allowing for parliamentary elections and small signs of, of freedom. It's really moving in the direction of, of, of more authoritarian, uh, you know, indications as well. So um, I'll, I'll uh, leave the floor to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Momani, and then uh, we'll continue the discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tuka. And Besma, to, to remain in, uh, in the political uh, sphere of, of Jordan, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you consider the relationship between Jordan population and the Jordanian institutions? So how we can develop what we have discussed since now? Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, Zaid had it really um, accurately that there is a, a, a sort of a deficit of trust in public institutions um, generally because of the perception of corruption, which is really the, the under, you know, undergirding this whole discussion, I think, is this feeling that there is an adequate redistribution of wealth, uh, that there is, you know, cap, sorry, crony capitalism at the very top. Uh, there is a system that is not necessarily in the, you know, working in the public interest, but for their own personal interests. It doesn't help, but I think that the political system also, while, you know, I think there are significant political reforms, you know, com compared to or the neighbors, uh, often Jordan does that, it compares itself to its neighborhood. Um, you know, there are some positive political reforms that have been done that are a bit more inclusive. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think you can quite call it a, a full and, and full-fledging democracy in the way that we would think of in a Western sense. So there's still lots to improve on the political side. Um, and so when people don't feel that they have a political voice uh, and that political voice is uh, working for their own self-interest and not for the public good, uh, there is, I think, dissatisfaction with the political process. Uh, so the institutions, and as, as pointed out, you know, the security sector and the military certainly have respect for keeping the peace. Uh, but at the same time, the question is, you know, that's not, I think, the foundation of a successful country to just solely rely on the security sector for one's faith um, and institutions. One needs to broaden that to include um, all aspects of the public sector, uh, which is really difficult for, for most Jordanians to have trust in when there is, 
increasingly everything from petty corruption at the bureaucracy level to um, increasingly, uh, I would say, a lot of waste, uh, overemployment, a bloated public sector is, is what you could call it. And so that really just puts, I think, a lot of pressure on the, you know, on the Jordanian state, if you will, to to try and keep this aura of of um, of success, and often it I think derives that more externally than domestically, and I think that's a real a real challenge for any country to really be more dependent on its external image than on its internal image. Uh, you know, I always say it's you know you don't want to be uh, you know working at sorry I'm going to give you a Canadian kind of example. You don't want to be working at General Motors but but driving a Honda. And so my point here is that you need to, if you're going to be, I think, a successful country, you need the people to have as much faith in you as a country as external uh, benefactors have of you. And that's a real gap in the Jordanian situation. I think there is probably more uh, lauding of Jordan's uh, role and, and, if you will, positionality um, externally than there is internally. Uh, and that is not, I think, a very good prognosis for, for the country, particularly because of the, the socioeconomic challenges that it's facing from a very, very young population, uh, highly educated, which is a wonderful achievement, of course, for the country. But it, you know, it's, I think, even more dangerous, if you will, if you have a highly educated society that doesn't have jobs, doesn't have opportunity. Uh, you know, you know what you deserve, but you're not getting it. So it's actually even more problematic on a political side. Um, and at the same time, the external community continues to put Jordan on a pedestal. And we see that from, I certainly have seen it from my vantage point of, you know, at the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, people often think of Jordan as, you know, the, obviously the most successful reformer uh, in their region. Um, and that, of course, comes with a great deal of social costs, uh, because we know um, this is, there's no mystery to the literature here that uh, when one country pivots to a more neoliberal approach, a stronger private sector, it comes with a great deal of social adjustment costs. Um, and we see today, as uh, colleagues have pointed out, unemployment is a huge factor. And I do want to point out on COVID, um, which we know has aggravated all economic challenges for every country in the world, uh, Jordan is even more so in that situation because we know that unemployment has doubled uh, just in the past year. Uh, youth unemployment's always been usually on average double that of the national average. So you have that factor. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of, I think, um, you know, good, positive good stories coming about the future of the global economy. Uh, I mean, my colleague talked about some of the forecasts that the World Bank has put forth. Uh, with all due respect, I think they're awfully optimistic forecasts, uh, and they tend to be based on this reality that, and I read the fine print, I'm afraid, um, that the, the virus will be under control. Um, and that's certainly not the case throughout much of the world. Uh, you know, we can, I think in the West, some of us are, are patting ourselves on the back for getting a lot of people vaccinated, but that's not the case in, in much of the developing world. And in Jordan, you have the added factor, which, you know, is, is a, we don't talk about it nearly as much, but disinformation and misinformation um, about the actual vaccine. And so, you know, I, I, I you know, as, as, a, as a person of Jordanian roots, I'm, I'm astonished to hear that, in fact, there's lots of people who won't take the, the vaccine, um, and that is not going to be a healthy recovery. You know, if you're not only dependent on foreign aid, but also you're dependent on tourism receipts, um, you know, I think people and, and tourists are going to be evaluating where they're going to take their vacations, also based on things like the positivity rates, the, um, you know, vaccination rates. I mean, that is going to be an important boost if you will, for confidence in traveling there. So again, all of these things are really quite problematic. I'll just quickly add to, uh, as a country that's highly dependent on workers' remittances, mostly from the Gulf, <clears throat> I don't see a very strong prospect for us going back to the consumption of oil and fuel in the same way that we were once were. I think we've all had a very important conversation in the West, and I say the West because that's, at the end of the day, we are the biggest consumers uh, of this. Uh, increasingly talking about climate change and the impact of oil and fuel. So I think there are some what we call economic scarring in the system that are just not going to return. We're not going to go back to, you know, the fanciful $100 uh, a barrel type uh, pro um, uh, prices. Um, so I think we're looking at a very, very slow global economic recovery. Um, and that doesn't bode well for Jordan, which is highly dependent on the external front uh, and also on donors. And I'll just last leave on that 
part about the donors. Um, I'll talk about my next segment about sort of the relationship with the donor community. But remember here, globally, every country is now introverted more so than ever. And that means that that fiscal space for a lot of countries to, to donate, to give towards official development agencies is, is diminishing. And I think people are rightly so going to be talking about we need to invest in the home front. We all have in the West enormous amount of our own economic scarring and challenges. And so I think what's going to be a bigger challenge for Jordan is that foreign aid envelope is going to shrink significantly. And so the whole prognosis on the global economic side, in my humble opinion, is not good. Um, and I'm afraid Jordan is going to have to sort of think about um, how it's going to manage the levers of political demands, which, as we heard from the previous panelists, is very much high and going to increase. It's not going to go away. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Surely we will return on the issue of donors. Um, before uh, starting the second round, I'm afraid we are running out of time. So we have more or less 20 minutes left for the second round. So I ask to each speaker to more or less remain within the limit. Of course, I invite you also to elaborate on any issue have been uh, in a way raised uh, uh, by you or your colleague during the first the first round, uh, regardless uh, the main uh, the main question that I will uh, immediately pose. Uh, Zaid, I want to start from you again. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, uh, can be the implication and impact on Jordan uh, internal stability for the region? Uh, what do you see? What do you think? So sort of going on with what we were discussing until uh, until now, especially with uh, Besma, no, the project as uh, on the internal dimension? Uh, a lot, a lot, uh, Paolo. But let me first, uh, just very quick comments and, and, and reflections sure. on my colleagues' uh, uh, presentations, which I admire, the three of them and their presentations. Thank you very much for that. Uh, but directly to Tuqa, to Qansirat, uh, and I, I like your notes about the Al-Hiraq and the, 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 the changes for the last decade, if you wish, in terms of the demographic and the, 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 the substance uh, and the content of the, of the Iraq and the protests for the last decade. And what is striking, actually, in this issue is uh, how organized, how energetic, and how, if you wish, courageous they are. Yet, uh, what ha we have to keep all in mind, despite all the negativism that's about Jordan and the economy and social uh, internal uh, stability, I, I think there is a consensus or quasi-consensus, something close to consensus that, you know, Jordanian wanted the reform, a serious, genuine reform within the house not to overthrow the house. And I'm, I'm, you know, just relating this to the royal family, within, not without, with and within. So this is very important to keep in mind because that actually leads us uh, in these our discussions and also, you know, helps us understand the most recent uh, events that, that uh, did take place two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, and then, best of all, I'm delighted to see you again. I think we met once, I don't know, I'll be traveling or something, but uh, uh, I certainly admire and respect uh, and I agree uh, what you've, uh, all what you've said. This, this uh, global economic situation that's impacting Jordan, for sure, is just going just to make Jordan's life harder and harder. There's no doubt about it. And the, the type of the political economy that is implemented in the country long away is all you know about winners and losers and a few wins and uh, at the expense of, of the many. Uh, and you know there was like an iron uh, law, if you wish, that is the security and the safety of the budget of the state, which determines even our foreign relations. So taking all that together with the vaccination rate and with the tourism sectors and with all the possibilities, et cetera, related to the pandemic itself. Yes, I agree. And that's why, you know, in our predictions and just, you know, the scenarios building, the best scenario that we will need five years to go back to the levels of the 2019. Now, taking that and that, how I'm going to link it to your question now about the internal and you know stability in Jordan and its relations to the neighbors, you know, this certainly will impact in a very negative and strong way the social stability, socio-political stability in Jordan. So, if anything, you know, uh, experts and and and. Uh, 
and organizations and, and concerns parties want to watch in is the domestic politics in Jordan rather than anything else, how this domestic politics will unfold. And Bisma has, you know, uh, clearly pointed to the issue of the external image versus the internal image uh, for whom we are working as a state, as institutions. It is to win the trust of our citizens and to provide for their demands and to manage the resources the very seldom scarce resources that we have in a very professional and open uh, and transparent way. So now, aside from that, and this is this is the asset for Jordan, it is the location. Just imagine Jordan is not in this part of the place. Uh, let's say somewhere in, in Africa, well, who will care about Jordan anyway? Uh, but, you know, this, this geostrategic location, although it brought with us all the challenges, as we know, you know, you're dominated or surrounded by dominant powers, conflicts, uh, instability, you name it, uh, not now. I mean, not even the last decades all over. Uh, but for all important players in the Middle East, uh, and I'm, I'm referring to the big four, if you wish. I'm referring to, to Israel, to Saudi Arabia, to Iran, to Turkey, and even to the Emirates. Now, obviously, to Syria, to Iraq, and to Egypt, Jordan's stability is an asset as important. And any internal instability in Jordan would certainly, will certainly, uh, you know, uh, spill over uh, to, the, to the neighboring countries, especially, and this is probably un, uh, unthinkable, especially to Israel. And therefore, the Jordanian strategic value, Jordan's strategic value for the region and for the international players, especially for the United States, uh, in my mind, uh, never lost its, 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 its appealing. Uh, maybe it is, you know, bad management, mismanagement on the side of Jordan itself, but as a strategic value for the role Jordan has to do, especially for neighboring countries, I think Jordan has still a lot of that strategic value. Just imagine a, a, a destabilized Jordan and centralized authorities in Jordan neighboring Israel with all the tensions between the populations and the images and et cetera, et cetera. And this should be a nightmare for Israel. So if Israel w would come and, for example, just, you know, and what they do uh, on a regular basis, reevaluate the need for Jordan and Jordan's strategic value, I think this is a big, huge mistake. And this applies for other neighbors, for sure. Uh, Jordan's for, 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 for now certainly has contributed to the security in the Gulf countries, not only physically, but just, you know, bordering uh, and, and, and uh, screwing the borders uh, from ideas and activities, not only uh, from ideas. So all in all, all in all, what I'm saying is Jordan internal stability and the continuation of a stable, calm Jordan that needs a lot of support, especially in, in economic situations, as we all agreed on, is a necessity for a crazy uh, region that is the Middle East. Now, if I want to say something about the Middle East that Jordan lives with and that why Jordan stability is a strategic value and a necessity and a need for the players in the region and in, in the global level, if you look at the region, you will see three important trends. First of all, of course, the Middle East that we know has collapsed long time ago. We're living in a new Middle East with the new rules and new players. But within this new Middle East, it, politics is personal. It's not rational. And this is very serious and scary and threatening. And there's an illusion of hegemony. Uh, you know, so certain players think that they can have the status of a hegemon. This is illusion and misleading. And the third, there is a serious nuclear threat, and that might lead to arm race and nuclear race. These, This is a crazy in its own region. Now, add to that instability in Jordan, you will just, you know, uh, set the entire region on fire. I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Zay. Very, very clear, uh, the, although very uh, complex <laughs> picture, but uh, we know the challenges are many in direction from, the, from where they come uh, multiple. Uh, Katarzyna, I would like to go on with you on, uh, on the external dimension of Jordan, uh, talking about the relationship between the EU and Jordan. We know that EU and Jordan for both are important partners. Uh, what do you think uh, the EU should do or can do now for, for Jordan? 
which area, in which area in particular. Right. Yes, well, absolutely. Jordan is strategic partner for the, in the region and, and has been um, for many years. Um, you know, when, when cooperating with Jordan, the, the, of course, we think the structures developed within previously the, the European neighborhood policy, um, regional stability and security has been one of the three main pillars for the cooperation between um, the EU and Jordan. Uh, and of course, macroeconomic stability and uh, sustainability has been um, the second one. Uh, now, a lot of times EU has been accused, not just in Jordan, on focusing too much of its own goals, not on the goals of the partner countries. Um, there's been attempts in the new programming, the Neighbourhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument, Global Europe, very long name, DG, um, to, to kind of reverse that. So we don't know the details yet because, yet because the conversations are still undergoing with the partner countries. Um, what the EU certainly wants to do um, for the entire region is to focus on uh, green, sustainable development, digitalization, and so on. But for the um, particular uh, focus for Jordan, like I said, we don't know the details yet. However, looking at the um, at the joint work uh, staff working document, which is the um, economic investment plan for the South neighborhood, uh, we kind of can get a, a, a picture of what is going to be the main focus for the EU. Uh, so there are from things like up upgrading the infrastructure, like the King Hussein Bridge, uh, for uh, supporting social assistance systems uh, to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, um, support the implementation of the energy sector strategy, which is definitely uh, incredibly important for Jordan. Um, focusing on more technical things like solid waste management, we know how big of an issue water is for Jordan. Um, also in political terms, when it comes to cooperation with Israel and access to uh, water. So those are certainly very important uh, things that he wants to focus on and in conversation with Jordan now they will develop uh, kind of more concrete goals. Now, um, in my opinion, what the EU has been doing correctly in a lot of countries um, in the Middle East is, is targeting an assistance in, uh, in the form of budget support. So kind of directly supporting the budget of the government um, to allow the government to implement selected reforms as opposed to, um, you know, giving clones or um, uh, providing, um, well, uh, concessional loans or providing uh, guarantees to loans, which are also important, are also instruments that should be used. Um, but with Jordan being so um, deeply over reliant on help and um, having a really big debt, I think it will be really important for the EU to focus on this budget support um, and not to over focus on concessional loans, which um, kind of has been a part of the focus under the macro financial assistance so far. Uh, so under the pandemic, uh, of course, you under the team Europe has been supporting Jordan among other countries. Um, there was a lot of technical help, testing systems, mobility of medical teams, data collection, and so so forth. But the macro financial systems uh, had a huge component of um, concessional loans um, to to kind of support the the support program. Um, that Jordan has uh, agreed with the IMF, and that uh, has been. Uh, very much criticized uh, among uh, not only researchers, but also the uh, population, perhaps not directly, but indirectly because of its um, effects on many layers of society. Um, so uh, to sum up, to leave some room for the debate as well, um, I, I would say that uh, it will be very interesting to see what exactly the EU will release apparently in mid-June in terms of the concrete goals for the cooperation in Jordan. But uh, my understanding so far is that it's going to be more uh, focusing on more technical things like um, water infrastructure um, um, and, and connectivity. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Katarzyna, very clear. Uh, Tuka, I would like... Uh... Uh, to continue to the, and that the other strategic partner or the real strategic partner of for Jordan, that is the U.S., and especially after Biden election, uh, how do you see their relationship in the, in the near future? And uh, what are the new opportunities that Jordan should take? I mean, in order? Sure. 
Yeah. Well, the view here from Washington uh, remains that Jordan is a very strong ally of the United States, and um, we don't foresee that changing anytime soon. Um, under the Trump administration, there was some unexpected and erratic actions that the administration took with regards to Israel. This definitely put Jordan on, a, you know, a kind of a tension between um, Jordan and the Trump administration. Um, but still, Jordan remained a dependable ally, but was getting less, you know, so to speak, love and care from the US, um, which was busy courting the um, Israeli Gulf normalization effort. Now, Jordan continues to uh, be one of the largest recipients of US aid, um, getting about 1.5 billion US dollars annually. Um, most of that is an economics aid, while part of it is military aid. But a significant portion of that goes to support uh, Jordan's efforts to host refugees. Um, Jordan is only the second, uh, only second to Lebanon in terms of its uh, share of refugees as a percentage of its population. So with the COVID-19 pandemic, we can expect uh, that Jordan is probably going to use the, um, you know, the, the strains on its economy as, as a leverage demand, asking for more aid from the U.S. and international community. Um, we can expect that the Biden administration will, uh, again, continue to support that and um, allocate more aid, perhaps, to uh, vaccination efforts and healthcare efforts related to the refugee population. Um, but as we saw uh, in the immediate aftermath of the situation two weeks ago or now three weeks ago with um, Prince Hamza, um, you know, there was unequivocal support voiced by uh, President Biden, uh, by Secretary of State Blinken, um, you know, assuring, uh, assuring the international community that Jordan has U.S. support. Of course, Jordan's stability and security is of utmost importance to the U.S. and Israel. Um, and at the same time, uh, the Jordanian role um, with regards to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, Jordan traditionally played a very active role in that effort. And we can expect that if the Biden administration um, hopes to revive some of those discussions outside of the parameters of the Abraham Accords, that it will involve Jordan more actively in that effort. Um, the situation with Jordan being, uh, you know, seen as, as, a, as, a, as a secure um, part of the region actually is, is, I want to point out that if people in Jordan don't feel like security is an issue for them or, or terrorism, as was maybe five, six years ago with the rise of ISIS, um, means that Jordanians are focusing more internally on, on their economic and political reform process. So uh, we're probably going to see that the Biden administration is going to quietly uh, encourage some political uh, and economic reform um, to ensure that these uh, social tensions um, don't boil over and actually present a threat to uh, neighboring Israel or uh, to U.S. forces in, uh, in, in Jordan. Um, Jordan uh, the U.S. has about 3,000 forces um, in Jordan. Um, the security relationship is very strong. Um, it was recently made stronger with this uh, strategic agreement between the U.S. and Jordan. Uh, we think that um, in terms of uh, the U.S. effort to slowly uh, remove troops from the region, this kind of agreement allows U.S. forces to have access uh, to, uh, you know, uh, access to, to security resources in Jordan rather than having to have um, boots on the ground. Um, but like I said, uh, you, more U.S. aid from, uh, for, more aid to Jordan from the U.S., uh, more vocal support, maybe some quiet encouragement for reform, but no significant change um, that we foresee in, uh, in the relationship between the U.S. and Jordan. Thank you so much, Tuka. And Basma, I want to, to finish this second, to conclude this second round with you. You mentioned before the relationship with Donald, now we saw with uh, Katarzyna uh, the relationship with the EU, with Tuka, with the U.S. I would like just to have uh, uh, your position on uh, on uh, this topic. So the capacity of Jordan to attract assistance uh, has been always important, So and it will uh, remain. So how do you see uh, Jordan relationship in this field uh, in the near future? Yeah, thank you, Paolo. Well, I mean, Jordan has a balancing act that it needs to manage, uh, and it's a really delicate one. Uh, and by that, I mean, 
you know, on the one side, it's very dependent on not just foreign aid, but the entire external sector, right? So it's dependent on, uh, obviously, FDI. It's dependent on, um, as I said, tourism, workers' remittances. So, you know, the global stability uh, is obviously very important to Jordan. But the key thing here is that it has a balancing act that I think is really important in terms of optics and in terms of reputation. So let me just paint a picture here. So Jordan has always been able to attract uh, money, tourists, you name it, to this very idea that it's sort of this, you know, a stable country in a neighborhood of instability. Um, it's able to get foreign donors, particularly the EU, the US and Western donors, to the notion that Zayed pointed out, which is that it's this moderate pro-Western country. Um, and certainly being a buffer state strategically uh, to protect Israel, which I think is a really important part of, of the rationale. But here's the, here's the challenge. The challenge is that, you know, increasingly the optics or the impression of Jordan is, is being diminished externally, slowly, slowly. And, and I'm saddened by that because I think it really does have a lot of promising aspects to it. But, you know, you're seeing increasingly new critics uh, of the of the entire structure, whether it's in terms of you know civil society organizations. I mean, the fact that we've had organizations like Amnesty International, Transparency International, that have all kind of degraded Jordan is not helpful uh, or downgraded, I should say. Um, certainly, we have Western legislatures that are increasingly asking asking some very important questions. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, they they do have to uh, you know foreign donors have to also be mindful of their own domestic legislatures. And so increasingly questions about, well, how free is this country that we are supporting? Uh, and I point out here that, and I'm sure Tuchel can talk more about sort of the domestic situation in the United States, but just look at the US Congress today. It's increasingly very different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. And so countries like Saudi Arabia, which you sort of thought, okay, well, you would never ever, you know, shake that strategic relationship. These are being questioned from within. And so I think increasingly these legislatures are going to be more critical, uh, and rightly so, uh, partly because I guess information is increasingly more available to these, you know, um, to these legislatures. There's now increasingly a diaspora that is now critical of their countries of origin and saying, well, wait a minute, while we want the success of these countries, we also want to see positive political reforms. We want to see democracy. Um, and these things are not happening fast enough. So I think we have to balance this, right? Because Jordan wants to always be, again, a you know, put on that pedestal for being this great pro-Western state. But pro-Western is not just about being strategic and geostrategic positioning. It's also about values. It's also about how they treat people. It's also about Again, uh, thinking about liberal values and democracy. And so I think it has to manage that. It can't continue to, I think, get all the benefits of being seen as pro-Western, but that on the inside, you know, be more critical, arresting teachers, um, you know, uh, clamping down on protests. Those are not going to be successful or positive images uh, for the state to take, um, you know, take to um, uh, you know, to foreign donors. So I think it needs to be very careful about that. And that is going to be a real struggle moving forward, because as I said earlier, the fiscal space for the Jordanian government is terrible. Uh, the consequences of the global economic crunch are going to squeeze donors' abilities to support it. And I think the global economic, you know, just factors alone uh, mean that Jordan is going to have a very rough ride. And it has a young population with very strong demands, including liberal democratic values, that it rightly deserves. It's an educated you know, population that is highly connected, increasingly well-traveled, I would say cosmopolitan in its own way, and, and wants all of the trappings of being called pro-Western. I mean, you can't say, you know, Jordan is this great country, it's very Western, oh, but we can't give you democracy, right? So it can't have its cake and eat it too. It needs to think about if it's going to live up to this wonderful image that it's curated for itself externally, it needs to adopt it internally as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vesma. I think also because Jordan is increasingly you know, discussed uh, uh, through its challenges and so much more than uh, it was before. So there is also a riding concern about the country that we are not so used, you know, I mean, at least in the past. So it will be carefully uh, checked and followed. Uh, we almost run out of time, but I think that it's important at least to collect, keep up some questions uh, 
so for you. So we have 15, 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, I would like uh, for sure to um, pick one question that is uh, uh, that can be answered by who wants and is not direct to anyone in specific. That is, uh, what is the most significant barrier to reform in the kingdom? So we go back to what we discussed. And the question go on, goes on uh, uh, saying, unfulfilled promises of reform has been a problem since before 1989. So is there anything different about this specific uh, uh, instance uh, of political and social tension? So the comparison between the, the crisis or the period of crisis in 1989 uh, with what we are uh, witnessing now. Anyone uh, of you want to pick up uh, and start to answer? Uh, I'll jump in. Yeah, I mean, of I th- Sure. I mean, I think the concept of um, reforms internally and, and the... the um, uh, the audience member that you know asked the question is absolutely right. I mean, this has been a discussion that's ongoing and it hasn't ended. And I would say that, you know, with all due respect, and I'm not suggesting that there haven't been positive changes, we've seen, I think, positive changes. But I don't think that the state and the powers that be ever really wanted to see Jordan become a full-fledged democracy. It's always kind of given a little, hoping that the population is satisfied with that little bit of, you know, reform, and then it would just kind of quiet down. Um, and then we've even seen, frankly, it taken back. Some of the the sort of gains that have been made on the political liberalization front have been taken back. And and the one thing, for example, sadly today, is freedom of speech. Um, you know, increasingly there are gag orders. There are more and more kind of restrictions on on new red lines, frankly. I and mean, we all thought we knew what the red lines were, but they increasingly change with time. Um, and that I think is really problematic. And I don't think again. And I have to reiterate this because I just feel that it's really important to point out, you cannot expect an educated, well-connected society of, you know, Jordan is not North Korea and the population of Jordan are highly intelligent, highly sophisticated. And I just don't think you can ask them to sort of not ask for demands that are that are commensurate with what you get when you have an educated, well-traveled increasingly sophisticated society. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, And one of the things that I think we have to be careful about is is brain drain too. I mean, this has really become a real challenge for Jordan. You know, I'm I'm saddened when I see the, you know, these fantastic surgeons outside of the country, the scientists, the professors. I mean, this is not healthy for a country. Jordan has so much potential because it invested in education, it invested in, in trying to get its society to think in that, frankly, in that cosmopolitan way. And it's been successful in some ways, but it can't, it can't do that and, and then put back in the genie in the bottle by saying, actually, you know what? We can't afford to have democracy now or no, we don't want you to ask questions. They're gonna ask questions. And what they do is just go to the web and, and, and you know, Clubhouse and all these other platforms to ask the questions. So you just can't, I think, stop the natural political and social development of a population. Thank you. Thank you, Vesma. Zaid, please, the mic is yours. Yes. Uh, well, a full-fledged democracy, uh, repeated uh, many times by Vesma, and I love this term. Uh, however, you and I and uh, the rest of us understand the logic of the transition theory itself. And, you know, it's fluctuation, it's process, and it is uh, democratization and de-democratization. It is liberalization and de-liberalization. And we've been through that since 1989, not only in Jordan, but across the board. So if you compare it with Latin America, Eastern Europe, even the United States itself. So that is not like, you know, uh, just a given situation that democracy and we stick to it, et cetera, et cetera. Democracy always wants people to protect it and to fight the protection of their freedoms. Just, you know, a few months ago, we witness something in the United States that can just unthinkable uh, this, this revolution and a coup against the 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 uh, the election itself and the constitution and the freedoms themselves in the United States. This is not to justify what's happening in Jordan. Actually, I'm taking this to say that democracy is not given. It's not something that uh, is given to people. Uh, this is this is a struggle. This is a process. This is this is how how this the Iraq. This is how the protest. This is how the entire uh, internal dynamics should ally itself too. Now, what is a fact today for sure is that Jordanian will not accept anything than a genuine political reform, regardless. Period. 
However, this genuine political reforms is actually subject to so many other strategic concerns, including the Palestinian issue and including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And hence, I refer to the identity identity crisis in Jordan. And, you know, in the depth discussion, Basma, uh, it is not a straightforward argument that, you know, yeah, Jordanian deserve and they have to have it. Um, I, I, I tell you today, uh, all these reports about freedom in Jordan actually are giving Jordan more than they should when it comes to freedom and democracy and liberties. Uh, however, these strategic protection for Jordan for strategic reasons that has to do with the Palestinian issues and the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the identity evolving, the Jordanian identity, the Jewish identity, and the Palestinian identity, it really practice its impact on the path that Jordan should actually go through when it comes to political reform. But regardless of the reasons and regardless of the constraints, there is no other choice for Jordan but to go for a full-fledged democratization process that would lead to at least an agreed upon consociational kind of power sharing in the country. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tuca, Katarzyna, do you want? Otherwise, uh, I have another question that original was uh, for uh, Zaid, but I think can be open to you as well. And I was uh, referring to what you said at the beginning about the, the data uh, that you found in, uh, in the service uh, about the low trust in the public institution and in general the condition of the economy in Jordan uh, comparing to the recent uh, uh, IMF uh, uh, support uh, for the country. So uh, the question is, do you think this could carry significant implementation risk for reform under the donor supporter programs? And, uh, and if yes, what are the areas uh, would be most problematic uh, in your view? I'll be happy to answer if there's no one. Of okay. course, uh, yeah, feel free to say. All right. oh, it was oh. for you originally. So. All right, well, I'll take part of it at least. Uh, well, look, I, I would like thank you, thank you, the audience uh, who, who raised this very important questions. And uh, as I said, and uh, there's an agreement among us, the speakers today, that uh, this uh, this lack of a trust, this gap of a trust existing between citizens and, and the institutions is serious, and it's only deepening and widening. Uh, and the IMF programs in Jordan, actually, most of the time since 1989 and forward, been like the symbol of the Jordanian criticism because of the, the uh, process of privatization and the structural uh, changes to the economy and adjustments, and also all the other economic reform programs that spin been by, been seen by Jordanians as 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 equivalent to first uh, enriching few in Jordan at the expense of the others, especially the social network and the social safety net, uh, and with the scandals of corruption. So what I'm saying, the new programs of the IMF is not going to help uh, in changing numbers or the uh, of trust. Or even, you know, uh, selling to the Jordanian that these programs are now more productive and uh, more conducive to a genuine economic reform that will deal with economic and socio societal issues, which will reflect positively on the people rating of the government and their performance. So unless there is a, an overall uh, changes in the way the resources and in Jordan is managed, and policies are conducted, including including people uh, in the decision making process by providing frames for that. I think it will continue uh, and even getting worse. Uh, Esma was also Esma was referring to the issue of education. Well, guess what, Esma? The rest are bad news. Uh, we lost the edge even in that. The the knowledge gap in Jordan is terrifying. And Jordan's educational achievements compared to neighboring countries even is just, you know, going down and down and down. Thank you, Zaid. Basma, you want to react? 
No, no. Uh, because I saw the the ants. I don't know if you oh, were sorry. raising ants. So, no, sorry. I apologize. So, That's quite all right. Uh, Tuka, yes, of course. Welcome. Yeah, I would like to chime in on the first question, um, just to go yeah. back for yeah. a second. Um, you know, there's the the question about um, you know the the reform process from 30 years ago. Uh, so much has changed, but two of the most important things that I think have changed is the perception of what the government should provide to the people and the demands of that, whether it's through subsidies or through engaging with East Bank Jordanians and tribal leaders, there, there was the perception at the time that there is a bigger role for the government to play in providing a safety net for Jordanians. Um, now the government is, seems, you know, naturally pulling back because of a number of different economic and um, structural issues has to pull back a little bit. And so there's this a gap in um, you know, generations of understanding where the role of government is in supporting individual people's you know, stability and their ability to put food on the table and their ability to have a job. And at the same time, there's a huge gap in the type of information space that we have now. So any kind of scandal with regards to corruption, even with the restrictions that are existing on the domestic media, it's very hard to control the story on social media. It's hard to control the story in international press, as we recently saw. So Jordanians have access to a lot more information um, than they do than they did 30 years ago about what is actually, what is their government receiving in terms of aid? What is the fiscal uh, health of the country? And also this increasing gap between a very small section of wealthy Jordanians. Um, people can see on social media when um, they can't even afford to go to college, but there are certain Jordanians who, you know, are, are representative of uh, a small group that have access to resources and positions that set them, you know, very, very far apart from the average Jordanian. So those are, I think, two elements that um, point to some of the differences that we, we're seeing now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tuka. Yeah, for sure, Katarzyna. So you will conclude our seminar. So please, the mic is yours. Well, there's, of course, there's a lot to add, but uh, all the points that, that were brought by the previous speakers are very valid. I, I would perhaps just add that on the issues of trust is absolutely necessary without it. No reform can really be implemented thinking about the tax reform if people don't trust that if they pay taxes, they share their income, it will be used in a good way. Um, of course, this will not be successful. Um, and that also corresponds with the issue of transparency. Like the, the government needs to be very open and clear why certain reforms are needed. How are they going to be implemented? How, what and, uh, are they going to do, um, like Tuka said, to, to make sure that the hard reforms that need to be implemented, uh, removing some of the subsidies, introducing taxes. Um, what are they going to do to mitigate the impact on the most vulnerable sectors of the society? And then continue to inform about that in a transparent way, basically treating people like equals and um, moving out from the paternalistic um, approach towards the citizens. I absolutely agree that the Jordanian society is not going to tolerate the situation like Basma said anymore in terms of um, you know, um, not having democracy, but trying to have the benefit of having an image of uh, democracy abroad. Uh, so apart from trust, um, transparency is absolutely um, the key and a way to go if um, the government wants to have a buy-in from the population with the reforms that um, it absolutely needs to introduce if, if it wants to save the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katarzyna. Um, so we are run out of time. So I apologize, first of all, with the audience. Uh, if uh, some of the questions, many questions of reality have not been taken, and so on, so I apologize for this. But in any case, I think that the, our panelists, our speaker, have really, really provided uh, a uh, very uh, interesting picture about Jordan uh, today, all the challenges uh, and dynamics uh, at stake. So I thank you so much uh, for your uh, participation, for your contribute, uh, and, um, and see you, see you next time, uh, hopefully with uh, a better picture <laughs> and, uh, and a better situation for, uh, for the kingdom, for the Jordan. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Uh
Thank you very much. Bye, Zaid, Katarzyna, Tuka, Bye. and Desma. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.